helpless, unable to speak the language, unable to cope with a gigantic conspiracy which seeks to convince you that you are mad, and you know you are the victim of a plot from which there is no escape. <laughs> Escape, produced and today written by William N. Robeson and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Today we escape to Paris at the time of the Great Paris Exposition and one of the recurring legends of the 20th century in Alexander Wolcott's version of the story of the vanishing lady. Another cup of tea, Bruce. No, no, thank you, my dear. I'll just light up my pipe now and have a look at the evening standard. I'd like another, please, Mother. All right, Alice. Uh, uh, uh-oh. Only one sugar, dear. We must watch our figures, you know. Oh, (laughs) what nonsense. A growing girl like Alice needs plenty of sugar. See, Mother, Daddy approves. Perhaps. But Mother is still boss. Yes, Mother. There's a dear. Mother. Yes, dear. I've been thinking... Yes, dear? I've been thinking about my grandparents. Oh. I know all about Daddy's parents. How Grandfather Stanley commanded a dreadnought at the Battle of Jutland. It was not a dreadnought, Alice. It was a heavy cruiser. Yes, heavy cruiser. (laughs) He got the VC and how Grandmother Stanley was a volunteer nurse at Western Arch when the Zeppelins came over. I know about your father, too, and how he died in India from his wounds and how gallant he was at the Khyber Pass. But, Mother... Yes, dear. You've never, never told me anything about Grandmother Winship. Haven't I? No, and I'd like to know something. Bruce. The child's 16. I think it's time she knew. But, Bruce... And you'd probably feel better to get it off your chest. What, Mother? What is it? Well, my dear, I've never talked about your grandmother because I've always half believed that someday, somehow... She'd come down our garden walk and... Oh, I know it sounds silly. And explain where she's been for the last 20 years. Why? What happened to I her? I don't know, and I don't suppose I ever will. Cynthia, darling, if it's going to upset no, you... No, Bruce, you're quite right. It would be best to... get it off my chest, as you put it. As you know, Alice, I was born and brought up in India... And I was about your age when my father was killed in the Kuiper campaign. Mother decided to leave India for good and return to her old home in Warwickshire. However, since it was necessary for her to go to Paris to attend to some details of my father's estate, she decided we should leave the P&O boat in Marseille and proceed by train. You may imagine the timidity with which we two unescorted ladies traveled across France without the slightest knowledge of the language... And without, indeed, assurance we could find a hotel room in Paris, though we had telegraphed for reservations for Marseille. You see, dear, the great Paris exposition had just opened and the city was jammed with visitors from all over the world. You may imagine our relief when we arrived at the Grand Hotel Universel and heard the clock speak in quite ah, understandable English. Winship. Welcome, welcome. Uh, you will please to sign the register. Uh, uh, you have our reservation. Oh, indeed, yes. Oh, most fortunate, madame, that you telegraphed. Uh, I reserve for you the last room in the house. Oh, I'm so relieved. Yes, Cynthia. You may as well learn now to sign a register for yourself. Oh, yes, mama. Where do I write? There, in that line. Oh, yes, I see. Voila. You are uh, fatigued from your journey, no? I shall have the boy show you to your rooms at once. Chasseur! Chasseur! Oui, monsieur. L'appartement 342 pour madame et mademoiselle Winship, tout de suite. Um, bien, monsieur. Uh, this is your bagage, madame? Yes, these six. Là, voilà le bagage. Cynthia. Il y a six pièces. Entendu. You, you'd best carry the little one with the medicine in it. Yes, maman. Uh, thank you. I'll take that one. Uh, the little red one? Uh, très bien. Uh, this way, ladies. Keep your eye on that porter, Cynthia. I don't trust this Frenchman. Oh, Mama. I don't think he'll make off with our things. Oh, here's the lift. Troisième étage. Troisième. Oh, my 
do wish we could have gone straight on to Southampton. But you'd only have had to come back across the channel to see the solicitor, Mama. We really saved time this way. I suppose, I mean, I wish we hadn't come to Paris at all. Such a sinister place. Oh, Mama. Voila, le troisième. This way, ladies, to the right. Attendez. C'est bien. 338, 343, 340. Oh, voilà. Entrez, ladies. Thank you. Oh, what a lovely big room. And look, Mama. French windows. Oh, and the park out there. And, and that square with the statue. Uh, the ladies did No, thank you. Yeah. Merci. Oh, the, thank you, those ladies. Those beautiful, beautiful bridges. Oh, Mama, it, it's like something out of a book. Yes, my dear. That's the trouble with Paris. It's so attractive. But underneath, it's evil. Oh, and Mama, the furniture, the gilt clock, and this lovely marble top table. Oh, Mama, everything is so... so French. I'll be very glad to be on my way to where everything's English by this time tomorrow. Now, come away from that window and help me get into something comfortable. There's a dear. Yes, Mama, of course. I don't know when I've been so tired. I, I just can't seem to catch my... Mama. <laughs> Mama, what's the matter? Mama. Mama, speak to me. Oh, here, I'll get you up into bed. There. Now, let me loosen your corset. Here, Mama, here are the smelling salts. Breathe deeply, darling. Mama. The telephone. I've got to get a doctor. Uh, hello, operator. Will you please send a doctor up to room number... Uh, let me see. Number 342. Pardon? Qu'est-ce que mademoiselle désire? Will you please send a doctor to room number 342? Je ne comprends pas. Qu'est-ce que mademoiselle désire? A, a doctor, désir? a doctor, please. Ah, oui, a doctor. Oui, mademoiselle, tout de suite. While I waited for the doctor, I did everything I could think of to bring my mother back to consciousness. I massaged her fingers and toes. I put wet cloths on her forehead. I waved the smelling salts under her nose. But she lay silent and white and unmoving, like one dead. Only the quick, shallow movement of her breast assured me she was not. And all the time, another anxiety possessed me. What if this doctor could not speak English? How should I tell him the circumstances of Mother's unexpected fainting? How should I understand his instructions for treatment? I'm sure it was not long. Although it seemed like an eternity before he arrived, accompanied by the manager of the hotel. And to my great relief, they both spoke English. The doctor felt Mother's pulse, took her temperature, and did the usual things that doctors do. And then he turned to the tail-coated hotel manager. La jeune femme parle-t-elle français? Pas un mot. Vous en êtes sûr? Tout à fait. Alors, je peux parler à mon aise. Monsieur, ceci, c'est une affaire très sérieuse. N'ayez pas l'air alarmé lorsque je vous mets au courant. Cette femme est atteinte de la peste. La peste? Elle n'a qu'une heure à vivre. Je n'ai pas besoin de vous dire que si ceci se connaît, votre hôtel perdra tous ses clients. Ils m'ont tué par ce monde. While they talked in this language, I couldn't understand. I looked from one face to the other, trying to read from their expressions how serious my mother's illness was. But they were as casual as though they were ordering dinner. And finally, I could stand it no longer. Oh, you must tell me. What is the matter with her? Mademoiselle, your mother is ill, yes. Seriously ill. It is a collapse. Due, perhaps, to the strain of traveling. However, a week or two of absolute rest will work wonders. A week or us. two? Well, we were to go on to England tomorrow. Uh, that would be out of the question, mademoiselle. She cannot be moved for at least several days. Uh, right now, she must have complete rest. The next 24 hours will be critical. Oh, Mama. Poor Mama. No, 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 no mademoiselle. You must not break down, too. Uh, I need your help. We, yes, doctor. Immediately, I need some medicine. Will you fetch it for me? Why, I must not yes. leave your mother for a moment during these critical hours. Here, I will write down this address and a little message to my wife. Your wife? Yes, yes. I have the medicine already prepared at home. It will be faster to go there for it than to a pharmacy. There are very few chemists who have the ingredient. But couldn't you telephone? Alas, uh, I have no telephone. Well... A messenger, perhaps. <laughs> Mademoiselle does not know Paris en fait. Uh, with the exposition opening, nowhere can you find a reliable messenger. They are all selling uh, souvenirs. But, uh, oh, no, Mademoiselle. You will accomplish here and more rapidly yourself. Uh, here is the address. 24 bis, rue Val-de-Grasse. 
And here is the message to give to my wife. But I don't know Paris at all. I'm a total stranger here. I am sure the manager here will give the uh, necessary instructions to the cabby. Indeed, I will. Now, if mademoiselle is ready... Before I quite knew what was happening, I was seated in a rickety taxi cab outside the hotel with the doctor's message clutched in my hand. While the hotel manager gave Maintenant, valuable directions to the cabby. En plus, vous pousserez un pourbois assez grand pour remplacer cette vieille bagnole avec une belle voiture. Allez au petit pas. Prenez la, la, la piste la plus circuiteuse. Et surtout, ne soyez pas de retour en moins de deux heures. Entendu Entendu. Bon. It is arranged, mademoiselle. Jacques is one of our most trusted cabbies. He will get you to the doctor's house and back in safety. Oh, thank you so much, sir. And you will look after mother, won't you? Indeed, I will. Of that, you may be sure. When we left the hotel, we crossed a huge square with statues around it and turned into a wide avenue which led up a gentle incline, at the top of which was a huge arch. But before long, we turned off to the right into narrower streets. It must have been 20 minutes later when we turned into another wide boulevard and I saw another huge arch up ahead. Or was it the same arch? Driver! Mademoiselle! Haven't we passed that arch before? Regardez, mademoiselle. Voici l'arc de triomphe. Là-bas, la tour est Driver, I don't want a sightseeing tour. I want to go to this address directly. Don't you understand? Now, please, take me there at once. Eh ben, on fait de son mieux. De la patience, mademoiselle. Paris, c'est une grande ville, voyons. At last, we turned into a narrow street and pulled up before a grim grey house. The blue enamel sign on the wall read number 24 bis. I jumped out of the cab almost before it stopped, rushed up the three stone steps and pulled at the brass bell knob. Oh, hurry. Hurry, hurry, please. We? Oui? Oh, oh the, the doctor sent me for some medicine. Here, read this, please. Retenez cette jeune femme aussi longtemps possible. C'est de la plus grande importance pour l'avenir de Paris et même de la France. Oh, entrez, mademoiselle. Thank you. Quand vous ne pouvez plus la faire attendre, donnez-lui une bouteille de pastilles. The doctor's wife pastilles. stood there reading and rereading the note as though she didn't understand it. And until I thought I would scream. Please, please hurry. Get me the medicine. It's my mother. She may be dying. I must get back to her. Please hurry. Asseyez-vous. She pointed to a chair. Attendez. And slowly walked down the hall and closed the door behind her. I waited and waited. And I wondered. I wondered about the time the taxi had taken to get here. About that arch that looked so familiar. And I was torn by the hundred nameless anxieties that torture you when your nearest and dearest is ill. And then I heard something that froze my blood. A telephone. A telephone clearly ringing somewhere in the house. But... The doctor had said he had no telephone. That was the reason I must come all this way for the medicine. Oh, no, it, it couldn't be in this house. It must be next door or across the street. Of course, that's where the sound was coming from. Hello? But no. It was the voice of the doctor's wife answering the phone. Oh, no. No, what monstrous plot was this? I felt my scalp crawl with terror. My brain pounded and my head felt as though it would burst. I wanted to scream, to run out of this awful house, to run all the way across Paris to the bedside of my mother. Voilà, mademoiselle. Ah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Now, driver, please, please, in the name of your own mother, hurry back to the hotel as fast as possible, please. Ah, oui. On fait de son mieux, mademoiselle. Roulons. But my pleading was of no use. Either it was misunderstood or ignored. We crawled across Paris, just as slowly as we had come. And I was certain I saw that same white arch three times. But at last we crossed the great square with the statues. And I knew we were close to the hotel. Oh, please, please hurry. Just beyond the great square... We turned up a narrow street which shortly entered a wide circle, in the middle of which was a tall, slender monument. The driver swung around the monument and pulled up before the entrance of the hotel, reached back and opened the door. <coughs> I jumped out of the cab. And then I saw the sign over the entrance. It said, Hotel Ritz. Driver? 
Driver, you've taken me to the wrong hotel. I'm staying at the Grand Hotel Universal. Well, no, mademoiselle. Je vous ai pris au rich. Je vous dépose au rich. No, I, I don't understand what you're saying. But will you please take me to the Grand Hotel Universal? C'est ici que je vous ai pris en charge et c'est ici que je vous l'impose. Oh, you stupid, stupid man, can't you understand? My mother is sick. You've taken more than two hours to get me to the doctor's house and back. Can't you understand? My mother is sick, perhaps dying. I looked around me. A small group of passers-by had stopped and were listening curiously to the argument. And then they joined in, taking sides. Everywhere I looked were foreign faces. Strangers, enemies. And then, shouldering through the crowd, I saw a bareheaded young man in tweeds with a pipe clamped in his teeth. And before he had a chance to speak, I knew help had come. Uh, I say, having some trouble. Oh, thank heavens, you're English. You're right, you are. Now, what seems to be the matter? I told him as rapidly as I could. And he paid the mulish cabbie. He popped me into another cab. Five minutes later, we walked up into the lobby of the Grand Hotel Universal. The manager was behind the desk. My mother, is she all right? I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. My mother, Mrs. Winship in 342, is she all right? <laughs> there is no uh, Madame Winship in 3242. What? 342 is occupied by Monsieur Auguste Noailles, a permanent guest. But don't you remember me? I'm Cynthia Winship. Two hours ago, you put me into a taxi to go to the doctor's house for some medicine for my mother. I am afraid that Mademoiselle is mistaken. I have never seen her before in my life. Well, look here, what, what is this? Well, listen, I swear to you. It's just as I say. We signed the register less than three hours ago. We got in on the train from Marseille. Well, let's have a look at the register. Yes. I'll show you I'm in 342. Where is the register? It is there, Mademoiselle. You may see it for yourself. See, today's date. Fourteen guests registered... But I do not see any Mademoiselle or Madame Winship. Do you? No. What have you done with my mother? Please, what have you done with my mother? I demand you answer me this please, minute. Please, Mademoiselle, I, what have you done with... I should not like to, to ask you to leave. Miss Winship, please. We'll get to the bottom of this. Perhaps Mademoiselle is mistaken. Perhaps she is registered at some other hotel. No. This is the hotel. The Grand Universal. You... You were standing there when we arrived. You handed my mother the pen with which she registered. You came to the door with a doctor. You put me in a taxi. But I assure you, mademoiselle, these are fantastic. Wait a minute. Your oh, what is it? Yours, that that cowboy there. He carried our baggage. He'll remember. Uh, garçon. Uh, oui, monsieur. Vous vous souvenez de avoir porté le bagage de madame en numéro 3, 4, 2, cet après-midi? No, monsieur. Uh, there were six pieces, don't you remember? You wanted to take them all, and I insisted on carrying a little jewel case. It was a little red one. Oh, no, mademoiselle... C'est la première fois de ma vie que je vois mademoiselle. This is he never saw you in his life before. But this is monstrous. It, it's impossible. My mother is somewhere in this hotel. What have you done with her? What have you done with her? Feeling better now, Miss Winship? A little, thank you. Care for something else? No, thank you. Uh, another cup of tea, perhaps? Certainly. Le garçon? Monsieur? Uh, un tasse de thé pour mademoiselle. Tout de suite, monsieur. I... I don't know how to thank you, Mr... You realize I, I don't even know your name? Oh, it's Bruce. Bruce Stanley. I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Stanley. It's a pleasure, Miss Winship. Mr. Stanley, you believe me, well, don't you? Of course you? I do, Miss We did Winship. register at that hotel. We were in room 342. Well, I can even describe the furnishings. There was a big window that went from the ceiling to the floor. Well, every hotel room in Paris has windows like that, Miss Winship. Oh, they do? Yes. Well, in this room, the draperies were plum-colored, and there was a marble-top table, black marble it was, and a gilt clock it had run down. The hands had stopped, I remember, at 20 minutes past three. The walls were covered in rose brocade, and the bedspread was a washed-out yellow. Oh, if I could only get into that room, you'd see that I'm not making this up. I'm well, I, not... I'm sure you aren't. Perhaps I can find a way to make them let you in the room. Can you? Yes. Uh, I'm with the embassy, you know, undersecretary sort of thing. I believe the British Empire has enough influence to change the mind of an obstinate Paris innkeeper. Well, then let's do it. Right away. Well, I'm afraid the might of Britain can't move that fast. It's past dinner time. But, but tomorrow we shall see. Tomorrow? But I must get into that room tonight. I... I have no money. No way to sleep. Well, we can do nothing with the people at the hotel. You saw that. We'll just have to be patient until tomorrow. I'm sure I can find a room for you tonight in a pension near the embassy. You're so very kind. 
How can I ever thank you, Mr. Stanley? Well, you, you might begin by calling me Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Cynthia. Oh. What oh, is it? Oh, I, I just thought of something. The doctor. The doctor? Yes, the one the hotel manager brought in to look after Mother. I still have his address somewhere here in my purse. Yes, here it is. Now, we must go there immediately. He can tell us about Mother. Now, let me see. 24 Bis Rue Val de Gras. Well, that's not far. Just off Boulevard Raspail near the Luxembourg. Well, how long would it take to get there by taxi? Oh, about ten minutes. But it... It took over an hour this afternoon. <laughs> So here we are. Yes, this is the place. Attendez, mon vieux. Uh, très bien, monsieur. The house is dark. Well, it's quite late. Well, I don't care. We've got to find out tonight. Uh, where is he? Well, there at the upstairs window. Uh, monsieur le docteur, cette mademoiselle Winship. Elle veut vous questionner à propos de sa mère. Winship, je ne connais pas mademoiselle Winship. He says he doesn't know you. But he must. He must. It... Doctor, don't you remember this afternoon? You sent me here to your house for medicine for my mother. Je ne comprends pas l'anglais. He says he doesn't understand English. Oh, the liar. The dreadful liar. He does. He speaks perfect English. Et vous, jeune homme, je vous conseille de ne pas déranger le repos des gens comme il faut et de vous en aller avant que je n'appelle la police. Ah, I'm sorry, Cynthia. Oh, Bruce. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? If it hadn't been for Bruce, I'm certain I should have gone out of my mind. He found a room for me at a pension near the embassy, where I spent a sleepless night of anxiety, almost beyond endurance. Bruce called for me at half past ten the next morning and took me back to the hotel. To my surprise, the attitude of the manager had changed completely. But of course, Mademoiselle may inspect room 342. We are only too glad to convince Mademoiselle that her mother is not and never was in the Grand Hotel Universel. Why, I... I, I personally will escort you to the room. This way, please, to the ascenseur. Oh, Bruce, that terrible man. That horrible, Cynthia, horrible... Cynthia, man. don't let him upset you. Monsieur, au troisième. Troisième, monsieur. Now, remember what I told you last night, Bruce. You'll see. Plum-colored draperies, black marble top table, rose walls, and a gilt clock with hands stopped at 20 minutes past three. You'll see. Yes, sir. Voila. Le troisième. This way, please. It was room 342 that you wished to see, mademoiselle? Yes, that's right. Third door to the right. Parfait. You see, Bruce? I know where it is. Yes, my dear. Here we are. Voila. Enter, please. Now, Bruce, you'll see. The yellow bedspread... Oh. Not quite the room you just described in the elevator, mademoiselle. The drapes are royal blue. No. A little dusty, I fear. Uh, I must have this room renovated. You see, there is no marble top table. No. The clock, as you notice, is running. And right on time, it seems. And no. the walls are not rose brocade, but yellow flowered no. wallpaper. Now, my dear mademoiselle, you see how thoroughly mistaken you are. No, no, no! They had tried to make me think I was mad. They succeeded. I remembered nothing until I awoke in my aunt's house in England two weeks later. Thanks to Bruce, who never left my side during those terrible days when my sanity hung in the balance. Well, that's the story, Alice. And that's why I've never been able to talk about your grandmother, Winship. Oh, Mother, how horrible. Because all these years I've clung to the foolish hope that somehow she'd come back and tell us herself what happened. You poor dear. You may as well dispel that hope forever, Cynthia. What? Since you've at last brought yourself to discuss your mother's disappearance, I think it's time you knew the true fact. Bruce. Your mother died 20 minutes after you left the hotel on that fool's errand for the doctor. Oh, no. She died of the bubonic plague. 
She had caught it in India before she sailed. The doctor recognized the symptoms the moment he examined her. He told the hotel manager in French in your presence. They agreed that the matter must be kept completely secret. If the news leaked out that there was a case of plague in Paris, the city would have been emptied of visitors, and the exposition would have been a failure. Oh, Bruce. The conspiracy of silence began in the hotel. The bellboy was paid to claim he never saw you. The taxi driver was paid well to take you to the doctor's house by the most roundabout route. The note to the doctor's wife advised her to detain you as long as she could. The taxi driver added his own imaginative touch by returning you to the Ritz instead of the Universal. I shudder to think what might have happened if I hadn't come through the Place Vendôme just then. But you didn't know? Not then. When did you find out? Next morning. By then, the conspiracy had grown to international proportions. The embassy had been advised. If the exposition was a failure, the franc would fall and the pound sterling would be affected, that sort of thing. You know. I knew when we went back to the hotel, you would not find your plum drapes and rose-colored walls and black marble top table. And you let me go through with it. What could I do? I was acting under orders. I knew that the hotel had completely fumigated and redecorated the room overnight, and everything was in readiness to repudiate your story. I had to let the last act of the dreadful farce play to its dreadful end. What did they do with my mother? Her body was removed from the room less than 30 minutes after you left it. It immediately burned. Why? Why didn't you tell me all this years ago? Why did you let me go on all this time? This, this is the first time you've ever mentioned your mother since then, my dear. Alice? Yes, Mother? There's a new issue of the Tetler in the library. Wouldn't you like to look at it? Mother, I want... Now, dear, there's a good girl. I want to have a talk with your father. Escape. Produced by William N. Robeson and directed by Norman MacDonald, has brought you The Vanishing Lady by Alexander Wolcott. Freely adapted for radio by Mr. Robeson. The part of Cynthia was played by Joan Banks. Bruce was played by High Everback. The hotel manager and driver by Ramsey Hill. Musical score was conceived by Cy Feuer with Eddie Dunstetter at the console. Next week... You are deathly afraid of snakes. And between you and a fortune... Between you and escape, you're on the white jaws of a deadly cotton mouth. Next week, we escape with Irvin S. Cobb's famous story, Snake Doctor. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, we, when we again offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.